All right, well, as uh, people come in, we can at least start the intro. So welcome everyone. Thank you for logging on uh, to this evening's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am a programming librarian here at Cary. Uh, before we begin, please let me know in the chat if there's any technical issues. Um, I can try to resolve them for you. If you have any questions or comments for our speaker, please use the Q&A button. Um, and if you, lastly, if you don't want to see chat previews uh, during the talk, um, there should be like a little button right next to where it says chat, and then you can toggle that. Uh, I'd like to thank the generous donors, Cary Library Foundation, for helping make programs like tonight's possible. And I'd like to thank uh, Lexington Living Landscapes and Lexington Field and Garden Club for organizing tonight's event. Tonight is part of an ongoing series of uh, presentations where the library is partnering with uh, Lexington Living Landscapes uh, to bring uh, landscape and conservation issues to the public, uh, experts in those fields to the public. So now please welcome Charlie Bunn. Hi, good evening and welcome. We're delighted to have you with us this evening. I'm Charlie Wyman with Lexington Living Landscapes. And before I turn the floor over to Trevor, let me say a word about our, our organization for any of you not familiar with us. We're a local nonprofit initiative launched in 2020 to promote more sustainable landscaping practices in town. So more native plants, fewer invasives, fewer chemicals, more trees. We grew out of a collaboration between the town's Sustainable Lexington Committee and three local nonprofits, the Lexington Field and Garden Club, Lexington Climate Action Network, and Citizens for Lexington Conservation. You can learn more about us, including how to sign up for our newsletter at our website, www.lexingtonlivinglandscapes.org. I wanna share a few thank yous. Uh, our great thanks to Trevor for joining us this evening and sharing his wisdom with us. A big thank you to the Lexington Field and Garden Club, which is co-sponsoring this evening's program, and whose grant to us is underwriting this evening's expenses. And a thank you as always to Matt and our friends at Cary Library for hosting this evening's program. After Trevor's talk, we'll have a Q&A session moderated by the newest member, <clears throat> excuse me, of our Lexington Living Landscapes team, Ellen Siegel. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, not the chat. We're only monitoring the Q&A, um, so write them there and we'll get to as many as we can. Let me now introduce our speaker and get out of the way. Trevor Smith is design and education manager at Weston Nurseries. He holds several landscape certifications and is a past president and current trustee of the Ecological Landscape Alliance. He is an award-winning regenerative landscape designer specializing in green infrastructure, native plant design, habitat creation, and implementation of ecological design principles. He is passionate about the natural world which inspires his commitment to sustainable landscaping practices in an era of climate change. Trevor, thank you for joining us this evening. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited um, to be joining you all this evening uh, and just uh, sharing um, some of my perspective, some real fun images, and hopefully uh, get you thinking about about land, about land care, about our earth and climate and all of the animals that we share it with. So I will uh, not waste any time because time is short and your time is precious. So let's get this up and going. And here we go. Growing wild, plant the change you want to see in the world. So when we're talking about growing wild or rewilding, uh, re-earth is kind of how I look at it. All the things that we are trying to do, what are we trying to do You know, when it comes to our plantings, when it comes to our yards, our gardens, what are we trying to accomplish? Are we, are we planting for wildlife? Are we planting for beauty? Are we planting for the future? Are we planting ahead, knowing that you know, our area is gonna warm? What is really motivating you and driving you? Uh, are you planting uh, alternative lawns like this one right here, one of my favorites, the woodland strawberry? Uh, it can take a licking and keep on and keep on kicking. You can't really, you can only kind of play a game of soccer on it, but you can walk all over it. Uh, it produces beautiful fall color. Uh, is uh, 
pollinator powerhouse. It feeds a number of Lepidoptera species. So it's a wonderful lawn alternative to have. What are you thinking about? Are you thinking that you just want to see more guys like this in the garden? This right here, these little tree frogs and this fellow right here are called indicator species. If you have salamanders on your property or if you are seeing any type of amphibian on your property, then you definitely are doing something right because they are indicator species for a reason, because they are so sensitive. They are extremely sensitive to nuances of climate and nuances of just, of just pollution, air pollution, water pollution, whatever that might be, or just you know toxic land and the lack of nat native plants and suitable habitat. So if you have any of these species, then you are definitely doing something right. And this is what we want, because what we need to remember is that we are animals and that we are a part of nature. And we need to stop thinking that we are apart from nature. And of course, we all want to see this in our garden. Why? Because this is the poster child for, for all things climate change and for all things endangered. And of course, we all want to save the monarch. And I think we should all, you know, I, it's a wonderful gateway insect to wanting to save the world. And I think the monarch is a wonderful uh, poster child for that. However, there are so many other insects and so many other wonderful, beautiful creatures out there uh, that equally need our support and our help. And we can do so starting right in our backyard. And that is what I'm hoping to prove to you and show you this evening. In the 2021, I was on a call with people who were recently evacuated from wildfires and people who were recently evacuated from floods. So I was here in Arlington, on a call and there were people down south who had had to stay at cousins or it were in hotels you know in the neighboring states because they had just been flooded out uh, and likewise there were people on the west coast who could not stay where they were anymore because of the wildfires and that was a it was a real not not turning point for me because this has been kind of like my my mission, my, my drive, whatever drives me uh, for so long. But it was definitely a, an awakening moment uh, to just to hear that, to hear the distress uh, in their voices and their commitment because it was a talk about climate change that we were all on. Um, and to hear, you know, to have their commitment that they still made the call even though their house may have been burning or floating away. Um, but that's kind of the reality that we're living in right now. Dr. Stephen Young has, you know, done studies and has determined that New England, our little corner of, of, the, of the world, uh, is actually warming faster than the rest of the planet. And that's just kind of how the, the climate and the tides move and the way, the way things are going. Our little pocket is actually warming a whole lot faster than the rest of the world. And you think, you, we hear about all the desertification and all of the climate disaster around the world. And we think, you know, how is that possible? But it's because that we're sitting in it and living in it that we're not even, you know, noticing that that is the case. And what is also the case and the sad fact is, is it's not gonna go back to the way it was. So, you know, what we need to focus on, we need to start being proactive instead of reactive. And we need to stop, you know, sitting here, you know, pining for the way it was and just being like, oh, feeling helpless. And, oh, you know, the world is, this is awful how we've done this to ourselves. And we need to start doing something, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm certainly not anti anybody. However, all of us sitting here, when you look at climate change, we think that it is the government's responsibility. But um, as I've seen happen in Lexington itself, it's a lot easier to bring our friends and neighbors together and actually do something on a grassroots local level than it is for the governments of the world to, to really get their acts together and to get along uh, and to find terms that you know doesn't, doesn't put anybody off. We're running out of time. So somebody has to do something. And I believe that that should be us because the way that we can do something is one yard at a time. And that monarch doesn't care about 
where your property line is and that monarch doesn't care about your property taxes or anything else that see that monarch sees garden to garden to garden to garden and that's what we need to start thinking about and working with right there is helping the monarchs helping all of our songbirds start to be able to move from yard to yard to yard to yard with minimal disruption and that is something that we can do and in doing that we can work with carbon sequestration uh, and we can also work with the hydrology of the planet so what does all this warming mean for our native plants? Well, here's just a couple of things. So for a winter like this, native seeds are not going to, many native seeds are probably not gonna germinate because we have not had the cool period that many of our native seeds need to undergo germination. It's been pretty much 40 degrees this entire winter, except for that one little cold snap and that one little cold snap did a whole lot of damage, but it was not cold long enough to germinate many of the native seeds that just naturally fell. It also hasn't been cold enough this winter to really push back all of those southern invasives that are moving up. I was really hoping that we were going to have something that maybe could knock down the, the lanternfly populations and, and all of these different invaders that are, are moving up you know, with the warmer climes. So the, the, if our winters keep staying warm, then it's not gonna kind of, you know, get cold enough to knock back those populations. Also something frustrating in this winter is a perfect example. The timing of blooms, this is something that we don't think about with bloom times and specialty pollinators. So if, if our flowers start going into bloom too early before their, you know, their partner pollinator has emerged, then they're, they're, that cycle is gonna get missed. That plant is not gonna get pollinated because we have a lot of specialist plants and specialist pollinators and they need each other. They've evolved together over thousands of years. But with climate doing the thing that it's doing, our trees or you know, on our flowers may start going into bloom either before or after the pollinators have emerged. And if we miss those, if we, if we miss that and it doesn't line up right, then we're going to start seeing a decline in both of you know, our pollinator insect populations, which leads to a decline in bird populations. And we're also going to see our native plants uh, suffering more and more. Hotter summer leads to tree, tree stress. So this is where it's going to hurt our economy because we're going to start you know, bumping into our leaf peeping season. You know, if our trees are too stressed and, and weird thing, weird, weird weather patterns happen, it may kind of start messing with um, with our leaf peeping season. And even worse, it could mess with our maple syrup production. And the something that just really just hurts me to the core is the thought of my grandchildren or great grandchildren only knowing synthetic maple syrup and never having tasted the real thing. And that just is, is awful and disheartening to me. So if that's not a reason to, to combat climate change, I don't know what else is. Things that are also happening that you may or may not have heard of. The, uh, in, in our changing climate, the UV rays that are reaching the earth have increased to the point where they are starting to change the patterns in dragonfly wings. And you're like, wow, okay, that's, that's weird and that's powerful, but what does that mean? Well, what that means is female dragonflies are no longer recognizing the males. Now, dragonflies are like one of the best mosquito controls that we have. Uh, and they are also, they too are, you know, are definitely an indicator species, at least that I, I dubbed them so. But the way climate is changing, the UV rays are starting to mess with the dragonfly wings. And now the dragonflies are not wrecking each other, recognizing each other as mating partners. <clears throat> Something that we've done in our fear of the dark um, has been, we have, we have lit our landscape to no end. And there is, you can go on and on about the, the light pollution and the damage that light is doing to, to nature as well as us. We hear about it all the time with, you know, turn off your screens and how the blue light is disrupting our sleep. But the blue light is also disrupting the sleep of all those who sleep out there. Blue light is also, or street lights are also disrupting the sleep of trees. Trees don't, can't actually shut down and go into full rest in certain areas where there is an exorbitant amount of light pollution. What does this mean? It means that we have weaker trees. But with all this light, spiders 
have figured out to make their webs near wherever our, our path lights are, our street lights are, our porch lights are. And you're like, wow, that's good for them. That's a very smart spider. That's, that's key, that's survival of the fittest. But what it's done, it has altered the, um, you know, the amount of insects that the said spider would capture on a normal basis. So it's actually helping to lead to insect decline, which then where, where insects play on the food chain leads to the decline of many others. So our lit environment is actually leading to the, uh, leading to the demise or the th you know, threatening of many other species. You know, one of the pieces that isn't in here, and I wish I had the, uh, I wish I had the image, but it just occurred to me, um, something that I teach in another class, fun fact, is, you know, moths. We see moths constantly circling our lights and circling our lights. That's because their million year old built in GPS has guides them by the light of the moon. So we've put all these lights up in our environment so their GPS that's built on board keeps recalculating and keeps them circling around and around and around that light bulb. It's not that they wanna do that. If you only have two weeks to find a mate and, and procreate and keep the species going, the last thing you wanna do is die circling a light bulb. So you know these outdoor lights that we have are awful and we really need to think about what we do with outdoor light pollution because we're having an extreme effect on the smallest creatures. <clears throat> the days of landscaping for beauty alone are over. That's it. We did it. We, we had our chance. We, we kind of blew it. Um, and, we, and we can no longer do that anymore. We can no longer landscape our yards, landscape our commercial buildings. We can no longer just put plants in the ground because we find them beautiful. I'm saying from here on out, every single thing we put in the ground, every single time we touch our landscape, it needs to have a and to it. I am building this garden and this garden is pretty to me and it feeds birds and it feeds the monarchs and it, it will help correct the hydrology in the soil. You know, whatever we are doing it needs to have something else with it. It can't just be pretty and then that's it. Our current approach to land care is akin to sending plastic, rubber, and steel into a factory without knowing who works there or what they need and hoping a car comes out on the other end. Now, this is a slide that I actually put into my professional presentation to call out all the professionals, um, but I wanted to leave it in here because this is, what it's, this is where we're all at. We have got out of touch with nature and aren't really sure of what's going on. So we fall for these beautiful labels that promise us all these things, or we fall for a four step that is just gonna make everything simple and everything easy. And everybody from a brand new gardener to a master gardener to a landscape professional is just kind of going through without even knowing what the soil needs, without even knowing what the plants need. We're just throwing stuff at it. And that's actually making our problems worse. So we throw around the term sustainability, but in reality, we talk about sustainability and we talk about sustainability like it's saving the world, but our actions speak differently. Our actions, the way our governments approach sustainability, the way most corporations approach sustainability is how much can I take without breaking it? That is our current real definition of sustainability, no matter what we tell ourselves or no matter what we're told. The, our actions speak way louder than our words. And our actions say, how much can I take before I break it? So the one thing I want you to take away from everything I'm gonna to say tonight is this. I want you to focus on regenerative land care. I call myself a regenerative land care professional, and this is why. If you look at our current climate and landscape situation like having the flu, you don't wanna think about sustainability. You don't wanna sustain having the flu when you're shivering under your bed with tissue stuck up your nose. You don't wanna sustain that at all, no. You wanna regenerate. You wanna get your body and your system healthy and then talk about sustaining. That's where you wanna be and then sustain from there. So this is what we need to do with our, with our properties. This is what we need to do with our planet. We need to help mother nature get her systems back online because we've made some mistakes. We just need to acknowledge we screwed up and we've done some things either you know, without knowing 
or we just continue to make thoughtless mistakes in the name of money or whatever, but we need to regenerate. We need to fix our soil. We need to fix our hydrology. We need to fix the balance of our plants and our landscape and regenerate mother nature system and then hands off, get out of the way and let her do her thing. And we can absolutely all live here just fine in harmony. But don't talk to me about sustainability now. Sustainability is something that we need to achieve. <clears throat> How good are you as a designer if the objects that you design cause harm, destroy the environment, or, or endanger our children? And this is, again, the challenge that I throw out to all my fellow designers because they, everybody walks around with a nice little ego, but how good are you? If what you've done has done nothing for that, what you've done to this piece of property has done nothing for anything else. So as I say, plant the change you wish to see in the world, like this. So what are we talking about? Yes, we're talking about natives. It's exactly why I'm here. You knew that we're talking about natives and we're talking about climate change. But if we're going to talk about natives, we need to get on the same page because natives is a broad term. Natives could mean everything within 50 miles of Lexington and natives could mean everything within Massachusetts and natives could mean anything in New England or anything on the East Coast. So natives always needs a qualifier. So we're just going to go through some terminology. So when we start talking natives, when like we happen to be, cause I'm in Arlington, so we could be in the grocery store at the same time. And if we see each other and start talking natives, we're gonna be using the same definitions. So native plants, like I said, they need a qualifier, but what are native plants? Native plants are indigenous to a given area and geologic time. This includes plants that have developed, occur naturally, or existed for many years in an area. Native plants can be weeds. Native plants can be aggressive, but native plants are never invasive. Weeds, weeds are an undesirable plant or a plant out of place. Weeds can be native like this right here, common milkweed. Weeds can be aggressive like this one here, common milkweed, and weeds can be invasive. Aggressive plants, and this is where people kind of get it mixed up. Aggressive plants are plants that spread throughout the garden of the landscape faster than we would like. Aggressive plants may dominate, but they are not invasive because they do not harm the ecosystem. Aggressive plants can be weeds and aggressive plants can be natives. I chose bee balm here because bee balm can definitely run through and take over portions of your garden, but it is not an invasive plant. And sometimes people will be like, oh, this is invasive. No, it's aggressive. Invasive plants are in a category of their own. It's a state or governmental um, designation and they are designated invasive plants because they are a threat to agriculture, a threat to horticulture, a threat, a threat to humans, livestock, and our ecosystems. Invasive plants will never be native, but they can be considered weeds. So as we're continuing, and when you come to Western Nurseries and you wanna hang out and you wanna talk about natives, you're gonna, or when you're talking to anybody, you're gonna talk about or hear the term straight species. So what does straight species mean? Well, straight species is the original recipe. The straight species is how the plant evolved through natur natural hy hybridization. Uh, it has not been messed with by man and any kind of a straight species will have variations between, you know, between multiple plants, it never shows up the same twice. So here we have the native columbine. It's actually red and yellow. We've seen it in a pinwheel or a kaleidoscope of different colors, but it's actually just red and yellow. And we have echinacea. So then we get into native R's. So we're talking straight species, original recipe. Well, let's talk about native R's. So what are native R's? Native R's are cultivated variety of a species, a native species, and grown for specific characteristics. Some are grown to be shorter. Some are grown to have double flowers or different color flowers or longer bloom times. So the next question people auto automatically think or ask is, are native R's and straight species the same thing if I'm putting them in the landscape? No is the short answer. Anytime you change the flower color, anytime you change the flower shape by adding double petals, you are likely going to reduce the pollen and nectar count. Does that mean that it is bad in the landscape? No but you can't do that to the flower without, without sacrificing something. 
anytime you ever change the leaf color, especially. So our native geranium, geranium maculatum has green leaves. Geranium maculatum espresso has those deep burgundy leaves. Anytime native plant is adapted for a burgundy leaf or a red leaf, especially, it is no longer edible by all those caterpillars that would need to live on it. The flowers might be fine, but the leaves no longer serve a purpose to all those caterpillars or insects that might need it because the chemical compounds are different. So anytime you take a native species, like Joe pie weed and shorten it like little Joe, that has not been shown in any labs to change the pollen count or anything else. So if it's just taking the size down, it does not necessarily change the quality of the plant. If you're changing the color, like with echinacea and all of the different echinacea colors, I'm not saying don't plant them, but don't plant them thinking that you're putting in a native that all of the insects around are going to rejoice over. Ecoregion. So <laughs> ecoregion is a geographic area determined by common geography, climate, plant communities. New England has five ecoregions. We right here are air ecoregion 59. So when I talk to people about native species, if I'm just talking off the cuff, I'm referring to ecoregion 59, which goes down through Connecticut, Rhode Island, and all the way up into Southern Maine. So this is an, this is an area, that area in blue in the map, this is an area that shares very sim similar geography and you know, by default has very similar plant communities. Now this does not mean, because you can see that Cape Cod is a different ecoregion. It's the coastal pine barrens. Now this does not mean that plants that grow, you know, just outside of Cape Cod also don't grow on Cape Cod, that they don't cross over. However, it is a different ecoregion because it's a totally different makeup, different makeup of weather and geography. This, that's, the soil is very different down there. You know that the plants are different on Cape Cod ecotype. So when you really start to nerd out on native plants, you get into ecotype. And this is one of my favorite things about plants. So ecotype is locally adapted species growing in a specific region. Ecotypes are plants grown from seed. Native plant seeds gathered from local areas and grown from seed have characteristics of that area imprinted on their genome. They are better adapted to the local conditions, such as weather, soil, rather than plants grown outside of the region. So what does this mean? This means that the milkweed in this picture, that is a native milkweed, native to this area, grown in this area, those seeds that you see in that picture have the memory of last summer's drought. And they are actually prepared their parent plant has prepared them to endure drought should it ever happen again. Those seeds will also know that two years ago, it was soaking wet all summer long. So they have the memory of this area imprinted in that seed. It's like telling your children's stories of, of your grandparents and, and everything else. They have that memory imprinted in them. So how does this differ or how does this make a difference? Well, currently many of our native plants, and this is just how it is, many of our native plants have to come from elsewhere in the United States. So I always say an ecotypic plant, a plant that's from here drops its R's just like it's from here. However, a plant just like any of us that are on here right now, if you were born elsewhere, but even if you've lived here much of your life, you talk about being born or your childhood elsewhere. So if you buy Asclepius tuberosa, the butterfly weed that was grown in North Carolina and then sold here, yes, it's a native. Yes, it's native to here, but it doesn't have all the memory of what the seasons were like here or what the seasons are like. So it is not the, it is not the perfect plant, let's just say. It does, it has a drawl and doesn't drop its R's whatsoever. So just to be fair, there aren't any producers right now that are producing 100% eco-region 59 native plants 
there are a lot being produced and I actually sit on a uh, on a board who is looking to source and produce more seed so that we can grow eco region 59 plants. So when you go, say you come to Western nurseries, you can come and you will find probably about 30 of our 30% or more of our natives are actually from 59. The rest of them are from probably like Pennsylvania or just outside. You know, we're not bringing in any seed from across the country, but they're just outside the New England states or just outside of 59. So this is just something to kind of keep in your head. It's something that you want to understand because if you can find an ecotypic plant, it'll do a lot better in your landscape. But just because you can't doesn't mean it's the end of the world. Biodiversity is what we want. Monocultures have to go. In this right here, biodiversity is going to help plants fight disease. They will certainly help fight climate change because we have plant roots at all different depths, taking up minerals and moisture from all different depths. We are holding the moisture in the soil. We are through evapotranspiration, releasing that moisture into the air, creating microclimates and cooling the air around us. But with all these different insects that must be in that field right there, you can best believe that we are gonna keep pest pressures down and disease pressures down because the plants will support each other when they're in a community like this. So why natives? Well, here is my best argument for why natives. I've used this a couple of times in a couple of presentations. So some of you may have seen it, but like I said, this is my best argument. So here we have two different geraniums. We have a greenhouse grown geranium and we have our native geranium, geranium maculata. Both of these geraniums will attract honeybees. That's no big deal. Honeybees kiss everybody. And honeybees are not a native bee. Both of these may attract some bumblebees. Some bumblebees are generalists. <coughs> Excuse me. However, the geranium will attract and feed mining bees and the sphinx moth and the tussock moth. In fact, by planting the native geranium, you will support 27 different species of butterflies and moths, as well as a number of different bees and flies and wasps. So when you're saying, why should I plant native? Because that one choice, both of them are pretty, but by choosing that one plant, you're going to support over 30 different other species. So now your garden is saving lives. It's, it, is, it is having a serious impact. So let me make an, another argument for you. So why, why does it matter? Why does it matter that we do all this? Okay, well, sometimes it's obvious. We want hummingbirds. Well, we're going to we'll plant Monarda. We'll plant, the, we'll plant bee bomb because we want to have those hummingbirds. Why? Red flowers and nectar and honey, hummingbirds love that. But sometimes it's not so subtle about planting natives. Like this, that's cinnamon fern. Okay, well, there's that hummingbird. Well, hummingbirds like red flowers. They don't like shady plants. Well, yeah, they do. Because that hummingbird needs that cinnamon fern to make a nice soft bed for its little tiny babies. So this is the whole thing. Plants play a number of different roles. It's not all about just the flowers and the pollinators. We have a number, we have shelter, we have food, you know, and then we have food for different stages of life. So native plants play a number of different roles in supporting that wildlife. So it's not just your, your hummingbird feeder or the red flowers. We wanna think about all native plants. Why? This is why, because 98 million acres of native vegetation have been replaced by managed landscapes and non-native ornamental plants. That is equal to all of our national parks and all of the land used to grow corn in 2014. That's a, you think, I mean, if any of you have ever been to any of our national parks and how vast they seem, how huge they seem, well, we've taken up a lot of area with our managed landscapes and our exotic plants. So what are the repercussions of this? Well, it is di directly related to the decline in our insect populations. And the decline in our insect populations has led to the decline in our bird populations. 
It takes 9,000 caterpillars to raise five chickadees. Chickadees aren't very big. That's a lot of caterpillars. But we need to have, as Talami says, you know, we need to do this. We need to support, put in these plants that are going to have the caterpillars to support the songbirds. Any of you who on here who are already actively planting native or who back up to, to wooded sites know that you have a number of different bird species going on in your yard. And if you think back to a time when you lived elsewhere, elsewhere, like if you lived in the city or somewhere else in town, to an area that wasn't as diverse as what you've created now, you may have realized that you didn't see all those birds that you see now in your backyard. We've now brought back the bluebird. I didn't see bluebirds at all growing up. And now I see bluebirds on the regular. And it just makes me so happy because growing up, my grandmother would tell me about them all the time, but I kind of thought she was lying because I had never seen one. And I felt like I had seen every bird there was because I would go walking in the woods all the time. And I was sure that I knew every single bird that was out there, except the bluebird. I thought that was a myth. <clears throat> the plants you choose could save a species, especially these three ladies right here. These three bumblebees are locally endangered, sometimes locally extinct. And it's all because the plants that they've specialized on, the plants that they've spent thousands of years growing to specialize on, just like the monarch and the milkweed, well, we don't find those plants really sexy in our garden. We don't really care for those plants, so we stop planting those plants. And then where those plants grew naturally, we put subdivisions and didn't put those plants back. So these three ladies are struggling definitely, you know, throughout our area. And like I said, they're either endangered or temporary or locally extinct, but we can change that just by the plants that we choose. These 15 plants right here, which you do not need to memorize. <clears throat> Are some of the, are the 15 most powerful plants that you can put into your landscape that could absolutely save the collapse of a local bee population. Dr. Jagir, you may have heard of him from UMass Dartmouth. If you haven't, please Google him, has plant list after plant list uh, on his website. And so I've worked with his website along with Talamy stuff and Heather Holmes stuff and the uh, the, some of these plant lists that I've created and the landscapes I've created incorporate a lot of these plants, a lot of the key plants that they say that you, we need to have and that we don't have enough of. So now we've talked about that. So now we get it. We have our native plants. We want to plant native plants. And now we know that even just planting native plants could make us superheroes and we could just start walking around town with capes on because we are saving local species of bees. However, there are some misconceptions of native plants and we also need to combat the misconceptions. It's just as I suspected. She's nothing but a common mobile vulgaris. In other words, a weed. We have to stop the, the thought that all native plants look weedy, that native plants are messy. That this is a common line of thinking even within the industry. I talk to people all the time that say, we need to do more native plants, except they're so messy. Not really true, but let's cover the truth. The truth is the bloom time is often shorter. That's absolutely true. That's why we have native R's with longer bloom times. That's why we wanted to do that. And we created those native R's and we created those other species because native plants have short bloom times. Some varieties seed about. This is one of the reasons people think they are messy. But these are original recipes. In the wild, before we were here, those plants had to keep the species going somehow. So they had to seed about. I personally don't mind it. I have drifts of asters in my garden that come up different every single year. And I like that. Sometimes it's a big stripe down the middle. Sometimes it's little pockets here and there. So I really enjoy that. Same with um, the columbine. My native, ac my aquilegia canadense, it comes up in a different area all the time. I'm like, oh, there you are this year. Hey, you know, nice to see you. I don't mind that. Drives some people nuts. If any of these start to take over your garden, simple editing as they come up, 
you know, if my asters ever get too crazy, I'm just, you know, I'll pull enough of them out to kind of keep them in space. But, you know, I like having them move around. And that's, that's a paradigm or it's, it's something that we need to, a way of thinking we need to shift. Thinking that all plants need to stay right there, the same size that we bought them, you know, the entire life of our garden. They do need water to get established all the time. People are like, I want a native plant garden because you don't need to water it and it doesn't need any maintenance. That is not the truth whatsoever. Especially when you put your plants in, they do need water. Once they're established, they'll need less water. But any plant, let's just take black-eyed Susans. Black-eyed Susans are extremely drought tolerant. But when you bring that black-eyed Susan home from the nursery, that black-eyed Susan is, that's a bougie black-eyed Susan. She's been living in the life of the Bellagio. She has had buffet 24 hours a day, big comfy king bed to herself, all the water and all the nutrients she could ever wish for. She doesn't really know what it is to be drought tolerant yet. So you need to get her in the ground. And then once she's in the ground and gets established and realizes she's not on vacation anymore, she'll be like, oh, okay, I know how to do this. And she'll become drought tolerant again. But once you bring it home, just because it's growing in that pot does not mean it's drought tolerant. However, yes, native gardens, once they're established, they do need less water. They do need fewer inputs. Why fewer inputs? Because native plants have grown up on our crappy New England soil. So they don't need us to make the garden super sweet for them. In fact, one of the reasons people don't have success with native plants is because they over amend their soil and then they put these plants in here and that's not how they wanna live. They want that crappy, you know, acidic New England soil. That's how they thrive. That's what they've evolved with and that's what they want. So they need a lot fewer inputs. They don't look messy. And we have to, you all have to help me change that, that point of view. They will attract wildlife. You just need to know that, you know, because the, 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 over the past, over COVID, the number one request, aside from, can you please add screening? I don't want to look at my neighbors anymore. The number one request was, I want a bright, colorful garden, lots of flowers, spring to fall. I don't want any bees though. And that is a request. I can do lots of colors. I can do spring to fall. I cannot give you all of that with no bees. So you have to understand that especially native plants will attract wildlife. There is a native plant for every situation. And it's okay if something is eating your garden. If nobody is eating your garden, something is wrong because your garden is part of the circle of life. And you need to have somebody nibbling, not decimating, but somebody needs to be nibbling. That caterpillar needs to nibble so it can get fat so it can feed chickadee babies because we want to have those chickadees flitting about. So this is exactly what we need. So where do we start? Well, now we're all excited. Now we want natives. Where are we going to start with this? Well, why do you want natives? Do you want natives because they're low maintenance? Because they are, or you've heard they're low maintenance. Do you want them because you want to create habitat? Are you thinking, have you read about green corridors or have you gotten together with your neighborhood and you want to make essentially a migration way station, you know, so that birds, when the birds and insects, when they're traveling, you know, on the, through their migration patterns, they actually have a place to get a bite to eat before they keep going on and on. <clears throat> Do you want it for the pollinators? All of these are good reasons. Do you want it for the birds? Usually if you have one, you have the other. You do need to understand, though, that natives, exotics, and cultivars are not the same. Your exotic plant, while it might be shelter, it might provide a nesting place for a bird, that's great. Your exotic plant, while it may provide pollen for generalist species, that's great, or nectar for maybe migrating hummingbirds, that's, that's also great, but it does not have the full-on environmental impact. And then we have the native R's or the cultivars are natives. So if you think about it, when you have native plants, it's like a whole, a whole foods diet. It's like going to the CSA and bringing this stuff home. It is as nutrient rich and perfect as you can possibly get it. And then when you have a native R, it's kind of like organic packaged food. It's kind of, it's still good for you, 
but it's not necessarily as good as if you brought it home from the CSA fresh. And then when you get into exotics, exotics are bright, they're beautiful, but they just don't have that nutrition. They don't have that value. So that's, I'm not saying it's junk food, but it's kind of like our junk food. Real flashy labels, a lot of promises. They promise a lot of bloom times, which is very similar to fortified with vitamins, but it's really not as good as if you had just brought that produce home from the CSA. <clears throat> Native plant does not mean no maintenance. We covered that. Having bees is a good thing. Happy bees don't sting. Anybody who has... Uh, lots of flowers in their garden and a big robust native plant backyard knows that you can go walking right through your garden, be surrounded by the hum of bees, and they are not going to bother you at all. Native gardens do look beautiful, so we have to understand that. And this is something that I am going to make you all aware of, but I do not know exactly when it will be delivered. I have designed seven native gardens and they are going to be put up on the Western Nursery website. These native gardens were based on the plant lists of Doug Tallamy, Dr. Jagir, and uh, Heather Holm, who's, who specializes in our bees. So I took all of those plant lists and I came up with seven gardens for seven areas. We have a endangered species garden, an endangered pollinator species. We have a pollinator powerhouse garden. There is a hell strip garden, a shade garden, a wet area garden, and I'm missing one. Oh, there's a hummingbird and songbird gardens as well. So this, these designs that you're seeing right now will be released. Here are, these are just color true designs. So the colors that you see are the colors of the blooms. Here is the plant list, too small for you to read. Uh-huh, you're gonna have to wait until it's released. And then each garden will look a lot like this. It's designed in 100 square feet. So you'll have the full on plant list, the numbers of plants, 400 square feet. So if your garden is 300, you can just come pick up three times the, uh, the amount of plants and you will be able to arrange them in your garden um, to however you would like. You can also combine those plants. You know, if you would like to have the endangered species as well as the hummingbird, you can combine those plants, combine that garden but they're just, I designed them all separately. So you kind of could design with a purpose or you could shop with a purpose. Now, Western Nurseries is growing all of these plants. You can find them elsewhere. I'm not certainly not a, a, an ad, but I've worked very hard on this. And I also worked very hard to convince the nursery to grow all the plants that I came up with for this garden. So they will all be available there. And like I said, they will all be for free for everybody online uh, coming up soon because I want everybody to be able to have these have the information and have the access to the plants. But don't you worry because it's okay if you like exotics. We've been talking about natives and it is okay to like exotics. Doug Tallamy says, I always did an 80-20. And then Doug told me that 70-30 is okay. And you know what? 70-30 is just fine with me. If your yard, if your property is about 70% native, then that is a robust property that can give all the, the insects and the birds and everything they need, what they need to live their lives. So if you look at it like that 30 is kind of like the cheat day, then that's okay too, if we're going back to food. You know, you're eating pretty good. And then you just have like your little cheat day and that's all right, because I like exotics as well. There are plenty of exotics that I have fallen in love with over the course of my career. So I am no zealot, by no means am I a zealot um, when it comes to native plants. However, like I said, if I have two plants in my hand and I know one is going to support 30 species and one is just going to look pretty to me, it's real easy to choose with the right one. So I made it in just right. I was told it said 50 minutes and I'm pretty good. So I thank you all very much. And I'm going to give you all my contact information. So please take it down because if you are doing a pollinator garden in your backyard, if you are doing a bioretention system in town, or if you are doing any type of reclamation, native plant work or stormwater water work in town, let me know. I'm just more than happy to help you. This is no sales thing. People get me all the time. Recently gave a very different talk, but a woman contacted me and she said, yep, I'm doing a meadow. I don't even know where to begin. Just walked her right through with that. Another person said, can you please just check my pollinator list to see if I've missed anything? 
So I am open to any and all of it because what I want is everybody to leave here feeling inspired and empowered to help reverse climate change with me. So I thank you all very much and I will take any and all of your questions. Hi, uh, Trevor, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. And I just became familiar with Dr. Gagir of University of Dartmouth, and I've been studying those lists. And I'm so um, glad that you mentioned it because it's been uh, a real change. It's really made a change for me in terms of really having an idea about what specific um, native plants will really, really work the best. Excellent. Um, this was enthusiastic and so informative. Thank you. So we have a number of questions that came in and um, there was some person who said they had two questions. So I'm just gonna ask you to type it into the Q and A and I'll go back and check on that. Okay. But um, so uh, let's see, one of the first questions I have is um, on the woodland strawberry, which was your first slide. Yep. Someone would like to know um, if that is the same or similar to um, what this person referred to as the barren strawberry. No, no, barren strawberry. There is a native barren strawberry, uh, also a favorite of mine, um, but that is more for shade. This woodland strawberry, um, maybe if you spent time outside uh, and, and poking around a lot as a child, or you might know a space, but it comes up with little strawberries about the size of your pinky nail, the teeny, teeny, teeny berries, but they are sweeter than an entire, you know, quart of, you know, of our conventional strawberries. That one little teeny berry will absolutely change your life and blow your mind, where that giant one may never even blow your hair back even a little bit. So um, the woodland strawberry is great. Uh, it does produce fruit. If you are lucky, you could get some of that fruit, but usually the uh, the squirrels and everybody will beat you to it, but it has wonderful flowers. And like I said, it, it supports um, different um, butterflies and moths. And how does the woodland strawberry compare with the Carex um, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania um, yep. which I think is um, a grass? Yes, and, and also and another, another, another favorite lawn alternative. So again, so the woodland strawberry um, spreads quicker and it does spread, so it needs some space. Uh, it's equally as durable. Carrots Pennsylvanica or the Pennsylvania sedge uh, will take shade. It will take dry shade. It's excellent for like, if you have a, a hilly slope under pine and oak trees, it's perfect for there. It spreads, it spreads slowly, um, but it is also, like I said, a wonderful lawn alternative. It does all of its growing in like the first four months or so. So if you mow it in like July, that's it. It'll basically, it'll stay at that, at that height, um, which, is a, which is another good thing about it, but that it's super durable. And for any of those troubled areas in either part, uh, part shade or shade and especially dry shade, it does really well. Well, thank you. Um, you know, we're, we're gonna be wanting to change over some of our lawn areas now. Um, let's see, um, in terms of, uh, availability, and I've heard this, um, repeated, you know, um, uh, in this area of trying to find the right native plants and trying to, there's a question of sourcing and it's very, very difficult to source straight species. Yes. Um, can you address that and can you address it specifically? if Western nurseries will carry uh, straight species or is it gonna be a native R? Western nurseries will carry both. So um, many of the gardens that I designed that I was showing you are built off of straight species. And that's why I said, you know, ecotype and ecotypic plants are something you may wanna ask for, are something you wanna look for, but you can not at this point in time where we're at, build your garden around or be so stringent that you have to make every plant ecotypic. Uh, it'll just be very hard. So um, I can tell you that uh, I, like I said, I sit, on a, I sit on a board with about seven others from New England, plus a few others outside of New England, outside of Eco Region 59, 
but we are really trying to right now we're culling down a list of 530 to come up with probably at least in year one the best 25 species that we can help bring to market next year for seeds so we have to kind of source those seeds and then you know get those seeds out to growers and create farmer plots so we can have seed banks you know that will keep it going uh, so it's it's everybody's working on it. So straight species are hard to find. Um, and that's where I'm saying like some native R's, like I said, like the little Joe, uh, Joe pie weed is, is an okay trade-off um, as far as pollen and nectar is concerned. It was really when you get into like a lot of the echinaceas, you know, they've just been hybridized so much that the, the, the value there isn't uh, isn't what it would be in in a straight species or something close to the straight species. So um, you know your um, question about that. Um, you know your I'm sorry. Your response led into another question, and someone is asking how to identify an ecotype plant in a nursery. So are you are are ecotype plants available in other regions of the country, or so, um, well, and the, but, but I so, know you have to get it locally for your region, your echo. Correct. Yes. So that's so every, there are local, there are ecotypic native plants for every region or every eco region. Um, you aren't going to know by looking at it. As I said, you know, if you get butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa, you're not going to know if it came from Carolina or if it was grown, you know, right there at the nursery. So it doesn't have to be identified yet. Um, so no, it's, it does not yet. And this is something that, you know, down the road, you know, would be great if designers like myself could create something and then send it out and say, these all have to be ecotypic plants. Uh, but you can ask by going to the nursery, you know, you can ask and you can say, which of these, you know, are ecotypic, you know, which is, an, uh, you know, for eco region 59. And th they may or may not know. It's a deep question. And everybody is like, this is like kind of deep native language that we went over. Um, so not everybody is well versed in it, but you will find somebody who is willing to geek out with you, I'm sure, at every nursery, and they'll be able to talk to you about it and, and probably lead you to whatever they have. So one of our knowledgeable participants mentioned eco59.com. And they mentioned it as a uh, farmer seed collective. Are you familiar with that at all? Yeah, the and eco, could you comment? Uh, the eco, the eco project, eco, eco typed project um, is something that uh, a couple of friends of mine down in Connecticut have started. They are harvesting um, ecotypic seed. And it is being grown out by another friend of mine. Um, some of it, there are a bunch of nurseries down in Connecticut that are growing these out and making them available. Uh, and this is something that Weston Nurseries is, you know, is starting to do as well. But Planters Choice um, down in Connecticut is growing a lot of the Ecotype Project um, uh, seed. So that's going to be all ecotypic stuff. And we're going to bring some of their stuff up as well as, like I said, growing, growing a bunch of our, of our own seed. Now you can get native plants at a bunch of places and a lot of them are, are small. So you need to shop around. Blue Stem Natives um, is another one that I will plug because that's a woman owned business out in Western Mass. Uh, and they, I have been following them, them since conception. Uh, and I would support them, you know, with everything because they are just living their dream. They're just trying to make it happen. They just finally got up a greenhouse. So they are also, uh, a, you know, a definitely a good resource. Some nice developments to look forward to. Uh, let's see. Um, one of our participants is asking um, if you would recommend a drought resistant ground cover for partially shady area in our local region. So that would be a drought resistant ground cover. That, that could be the Carex Pennsylvanica or Carex Appalachia. If you, if you want something grassy, um, some grassy looking. Um, coming to, I mean, ground cover, I mean, even the strawberry, 
uh, and barren strawberry are somewhat drought resistant once established. Um, and then I guess it, you know, certain things, it comes down to ground cover if you're looking for creepers or if you're just looking for um, plants that will spread wide. So, but those would be kind of like off the top of my head, things that I would put in there. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, we have, um, someone has brought up um, um, a concern and I hope I'm representing this uh, correctly. Um, and it's Laura and she said that um, some of the natives are state listed rare plants. So that's a quote in her question. And then she uh, mentioned that plant conservationists are concerned about there being, um, about um, these being imported um, from other areas. So um, I think that kind of gets to knowing your source or there's, are there other elements there that I'm missing? So this is a question again with the, uh, the Northeast um, Seed Network. Uh, that that we're addressing that uh, endangered and rare plants uh, are not anything that we are going to put on our list or go after anytime soon. Uh, endangered and rare, there's one. There is an argument to help propagate the species, uh, but that being said, there are you know there's so many caveats to each one of them. So endangered and rare should be left alone. And if anybody is um, selling endangered and rare, I would question where they might be finding those because uh, you should not be like, they should not be available at nurseries. You know, things like, you know, our lady slippers and, and the like, you know, should, should not be available. Many trillium should not be available. Um, so you need, you definitely need to be wary uh, and, and, and ask, ask how they, how they came upon these things. All right, um, let's see. I'm just trying to uh, catch up a little bit. Could you um, talk a little bit about um, if you have a native plant and the, um, let's say the industry, your industry is changing it or uh, cultivating it to be a native var, could that help with climate change a little bit um, in terms of, um, you know, it, giving, uh, uh, providing that native plant, which is now a native R with a longer uh, bloom time. So uh, it, the, it can feed pollinators for a longer time. The bloom time certainly uh, not necessarily going to help that I can think of. Um, by making plants, I guess, if you could make them a little more like disease resistant, sure, that, that would be helpful. Um, but bloom times are really are really for us. Uh, it's you know they, you know when we're creating when I'm creating a garden, yes, native plants have shorter bloom times. Just means you can plant more plants. Um, you know some have longer, some have shorter. You know what we what I encourage we do as a people is start appreciating nature's fleeting moments. And, and, those, and those moments of beauty, which we've stopped doing because we have tomatoes and strawberries, you know, in January and year round and on demand. And because all of our TV and all of our entertainment is on demand, we still want nature to be on demand and performing for us all the time, rather than taking the moment to, you know, ap appreciate and to notice those beautiful moments that happen. So I would encourage that we go back the other way and we meet nature kind of where she's at on that rather than taking all of these measures to make her perform, you know, to our, to our level. So let's get back to the alternative lawn question, if you don't mind. Sure. And um, we have um, an attendee who would like to know an alternative lawn that might be best for young children. I would have to say almost any alternative lawn would be best for young, young children. Uh, it depends what you want to do. You're not on most alternative lawns. Um, you are not going to have soccer games. Um, you know, like I said, on the strawberry, you can run. On the carrots, you can run. Uh, clover, not a native plant, but is a lawn alternative. 
you can you could play soccer on that you can run around on that um but many of the lawn alternatives if you get in you know depending on what you might get into other non-natives would be like time um if you get into things like that those are more to look at those are more to walk over but i mean if you're going to uh if you're going to wrestle and be playing playing any traditional i guess sport games on your lawn then it's, it's not really conducive to young kids. If you have young kids who are just going to run around all over the strawberries and look under the leaves and try to find berries and appreciate the color and pick the flowers, um, then that is, that is a perfect lawn for you. Um, so I guess it depends what you want to do. I grew up with a very mixed lawn. So I am more than happy to have violets and, you know, all sorts of mixed species within my lawn, you know, blooming uh, blooming away and uh, it makes it makes me very happy so I guess it depends what you're what you're looking for do you have the name uh, the scientific genus and species name for the woodland strawberry that you've mentioned Fregaria virginiana okay can you say that one more time please Fregaria virginiana okay thank you okay I hope that was helpful so people can kind of get it down real quickly and what are the grasses that are growing right behind you, Trevor? Oh, this is a mix. So right behind me is just a mix of meadow grasses that have actually seeded themselves in. So this was a real fun uh, meadow project, kind of uh, like a wild area. They had a, a big area that they didn't want to mow anymore, and they didn't want to be uh, to be grass anymore. So we brought in a bunch of um, a bunch of native species. And then some of the grass just kind of grew up and around it. So we have uh, panicum back there. So we have switchgrass, native switchgrass. We have blue stem. We have the rudbeckia. But then we also have some of the, the non-native grasses that just came up through it because their idea really was just to let it go wild. So like the flowers kind of come and go and they do their thing. Um, but it wasn't like they were trying to have a pure, you know, floral meadow. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, if a plant is, uh, this is another question. If a plant is in um, a certain area for a number of seasons, does it adapt and become like ecotypic for that maybe new or similar region? So I get this question all the time. It is a question that I have and I am working on getting the answer. There is one woman who I would trust probably to give me that answer. Her name is Sephra Alexandra and she goes by the Seed Huntress. And if I am going to trust anybody's word on when a plant becomes uh, ecotypic, if ever, I would, I would trust her. Um, I have yet to, to have a, a long enough conversation. Every time we're talking, we have other things to talk about. But I would, she's, she's the one that I'm going to pose that to because I get asked that question all the time and I can't answer it honestly. Well, I, I, I love your honesty about it. And, uh, you know, this is an area that's really evolving as we are. Uh, let's see. Uh, there was another question about, um, they uh, asked about collecting seeds from wild plants. So um, I'm not sure in what direction they want you to answer that, but maybe you can tackle that, Trevor. Um, so, well, first off, you have to be careful because you want to make sure those wild plants are not endangered or rare. Uh, and you want to make sure that those, if you just say you are, you come across, you know, a small patch of plants, well, then knowing that if you came across like this little tiny cops of aster um, that if you harvest the seeds from that, now you are keeping that plant um, from continuing to spread and grow in that area. So when you do harvest wild seed, uh, you do need to be kind of conscientious and careful and don't take all of everything. It's just like with foraging. Uh, you don't wanna take it all, but it's okay to take some. <clears throat> um, and especially you know, if you and your friends or your neighbors are all growing native plants. So for instance, at Weston, you know, all of our, all of our milkweed or the, I want to say all of, I'm pretty sure almost all 
if not all of our milkweed is ecotypic and has all been harvested, um, you know, within this within this region, but we also swap. So like I have plants in my backyard and I will give somebody, you know, the you know, swamp milkweed, Asclepias incarnata. And I will, you know, I'll share that with somebody and we'll kind of share seeds around, you know, at work. And you could definitely do that, you know, with your friends in the fall, share all those seeds around, you know, keep them, you know, nice and dry. And then, you know, get them in the fridge at like this time of year between a couple of damp paper towels so you can get them germinating and you can get them in the ground for yourself. Uh, let's see. Um, can you recommend uh, some drought? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you recommend some native conifer trees or tall shrubs, which could be used as a screen um, between neighbors, but also that these um, tall shrubs or conifer trees would be welcome to would be welcoming to birds. Sure. So. Um... Tall shrubs, you could look at serviceberry, amelanchia. You can look at viburnum, uh, dentatum, so the arrowwood viburnum, the uh, American cranberry viburnum, uh, two of the ones that I love, viburnum uh, nudum, which I don't know what the common for that one is, um, is another one that I, I really love. Um, and then the the local ilex species, so ilex glabra, which is the inkberry, can get rather tall. It depends on how tall you want. Uh, if you're looking to replace like arborvitae, that gets a little harder. Then you have to get into pines, firs, um, and those are they 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 certainly don't grow the same as you know say like the arborvitae would. But like the the white pine, uh, the um, Picea rubens, the red, the red spruce, and the balsam fir um, are both, you know, are both evergreen species that you could work with. And then low trees uh, that you could work with would be spice bush, witch hazel, um, silver bell, red bud, dogwoods. So you could create a nice mixed screen, keeping the evergreens um, either in the most offensive lines of sight or keep like an evergreen uh, hedge down below and some taller deciduous stuff off top. So when you're in your backyard in those warmer months, you'll be totally, you know, closed in. And then in the winter, yes, you'd be able to have a filtered screen. It would not be that full evergreen screen. But we don't necessarily have uh, a lot of native trees that grow like a lot of the typical screen trees, like an arborvitae um, that, that you could use. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been really happy with my balsam fir. And it's then just uh, building some understory trees, like your red bud or you know, several of the ones you mentioned are just really terrific. Yeah. What you about can also do the juniper, but you can't do you can't do the native juniper if you have the service berry because ah. of cedar apple rust, your service berries, berries will basically look like the COVID virus. So you can't, if you want to have service berry, you can't have juniper. Or if your neighbor has juniper, then don't even try to have service berry because you won't be able to get it. And that was because uh, some kind of a, a mold? Cedar or... apple rust. Yep. It's a, oh. it's a fungal disease. It doesn't kill either plant, but they pass it back and forth. Oh, they... that's no fun. No. Okay. Well, it makes the berries inedible. So that's no fun. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're um, just going to uh, move into like our last question. Um, I just want to, uh, sorry about this. We've just had so many wonderful, wonderful questions and I'm just trying to be sure I get um, everyone uh, covered. And if I didn't oh. answer, you can always just email me and I'll answer them on the other end. Okay, all right. So um, someone was mentioning what to plant to uh, resist um, ticks. And then I have one question after that. 
what to plant to resist ticks. Well, ticks is more of a how to plant and less of a what to plant. Um, I can tell you what not to plant. You don't want to barberry, which you shouldn't be planting anyway, but if you have it, uh, would be a great thing to get rid of because it is a perfect uh, habitat for ticks. Um, but as far as ticks are concerned, it's more of a how and ticks hang out in the, in the, in the interim area where the, where the wood line really changes over to lawn. So if you're in the middle of your lawn, chances are no ticks. It's that usually that part shaded uh, area where the, where things, um, where the kind of the, the terrain crosses over is, is where you find them most. So it's really just to be careful in that area or if you have a large property, uh, keeping that area, you know, mown, uh, keep it nice and short and you will have fewer ticks because they, they need, they dry out very fast and they don't want to be baking in the sun all the time. So I would like to move to our um, last question. And um, that is, um, what about shrubs for the back of a bed? And it sounded like it could be like a perennial bed. So, okay, so my favorite shrubs to, uh, to incorporate um, into, into beds really anywhere would be uh, Fothergilla, uh, which is, you know, that's, that's a great one. Calicanthus, which is the sweet shrub, I think it's, is the other name. Uh, so Fothergilla, Calicanthus, Itea, um, Ilex glabra. Again, with the uh, I, I I'll go with um, beautyberry and physocarpus, either or. Uh, if you can find the native varieties, if not, native ours are very beautiful uh, with both of those. Um, I got a I got just tons kind of swimming through my head, but I'm thinking small. I'm trying to think things that stay kind of small and compact or more upright. The other things would be more like the viburnum. So I love to use, I love to use Calethra, viburnum, Itea, Fothergilla. I will probably put those in most anything. Then I'll do like the, the Ilex glabra, the inkberry, or Ilex verticillata, the winterberry. Uh, I love to play with those. And then I get into high bush blueberry, which is another one. If you have the, that acidic New England soil and a, and a moist area, go with it. Just em embrace it and get those high bush blueberries because they're gorgeous and delicious. I just want to thank you, Trevor, so much. This has just been a thrill. It's been so informative. I've learned so much. Um, our participants have just been really generous with their questions. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions, but we just really needed to wrap up. Trevor, thank you for joining us this evening and sharing your wisdom with us. It's just been absolutely terrific. Thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us. Thank you again to the Lexington Field and Garden Club for helping make this evening possible. And thanks to Matt and to the Cary Library for hosting. Don't forget Le Lexington Living Landscapes um, if you would like to receive the newsletter. And Trevor, thank you so much. Thank you You've so been much. Very I appreciate it, everybody. Thank you. Have a great night. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone.